Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. John Snow. No, not that John Snow. We're talking about John Snow from London, the doctor. We're talking about a doctor from a time in London when sewage was flowing down the streets into the river and people were drinking that same water. So John Snow grew up poor in York, England. His father was uh, worked at a coal yard, but John demonstrated that he was good at mathematics problem solving and eventually got his way into a local school of medicine, the Hunterian School of Medicine, and later began working at the Westminster Hospital. He became admitted as a surgeon. Oh, sorry, he was born in 1813. And then he graduated from the University of London in 1844, and then became a physician in 1850. So his life was going pretty good. I wonder what he was drinking, Nick. Um, oh, shoot, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I guess since we're already into it, Jon Snow is probably drinking ether, but what are you drinking, Mike? <laughs> uh, that's something I've never had and I probably don't want to have, but I'm drinking some uh, gin and juice. What about you? What are you drinking? Uh, some Coors Light. So Jon Snow was way ahead of his time. What, drinking ether? <laughs> his use of ether. He was one of the first people to look at anesthesiology. So before he would perform a surgery, he would give people ether or chloroform to lessen their pain. Now, to put this into perspective, the surgeons of the time were known for one thing. You know how we have good surgeons today because they're good at what they do? Well, back then they had fast surgeons because there was no numbing agents. You could drink a little bit of some kind of liquor or maybe some laudanum, but not too much because... You don't want to thin your blood out too much and bleed out and die. So surgeons were known for their speed. A good surgeon could get an arm off in under three minutes because you'd have to be awake for the whole operation. Uh, no, no, thank you. He started experimenting with anesthesia. He started giving people ether and then moved on to chloroform. And he exper he did actual, like, really detailed experiments recorded why some experiments didn't work and some did using variables such as amount where it was applied. So instead of just filling up the room, which is obviously bad because you don't want your surgeon to pass out, but applying it directly to the face in what concentrations, the person's body type and the external room temperature, using all those variables to try and get an idea of how much to give to a person because you don't want to give too little and that person wakes up halfway through, you don't want to give too much, and they don't wake up at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, that'd be very bad. <laughs> Either or there. So there's a sweet spot in there, but at the time, in the 1840s and 30s, we didn't know that, so you know someone had to do that work. So he uh, started recording all this and publishing it, and so he kind of made a name for himself, but... Nothing too crazy because he wasn't like he was like a rock star doctor or anything because back then pretty much anyone could publish anything. And I mean, still, this is the same time when people were selling snake snake oil potions for cure-alls for everything. So, you know, this guy doing actual medicine kind of gets lumped in with these people. <laughs> the people, you know, selling you this, this serum that's going to cure your pretty much anything it's gonna you know it's gonna cure your hangover and it's gonna present or it's gonna prevent all your sexually transmitted disease oh miracle cure how amazing out of curiosity nick uh with this experimentation was he just testing on patients or like for actual surgeries or was he just kind of doing it on volunteers so to speak so he did it on birds patience and himself how uh, okay that's interesting to do it on yourself at least i mean that's a that's a bold move there cotton yeah uh i mean 
it worked though. But okay, so I guess one last thing about his experimenting with anesthesia. At the time, he would also administer ether to to women in labor, and so he'd administer ether to women in labor to help with to reduce labor pains. And yeah, he was this was considered taboo by a lot of people, including the church. But Queen Victoria asked him to administer it to her during her childbirth. And then, you know, once the queen does it, it's popular. It's popular. I mean, that's no one's cooler than the queen in London, I imagine. <laughs> but all of that, which kind of started a whole another part of medicine, really isn't even what he's known for. I mean, this is kind of just a blip in his career. The big event that Jon Snow is known for was the 1854 cholera outbreak. Now, to understand, you kind of have to... I'm going to paint a little bit of a picture of London. London, at this time, had 2 million people. It was like the largest city in the world. And it was disgusting. People would shit in the... They'd shit, you know, in a pot, throw it out the window, and these guys who worked all night would clean it up, and then they'd put it in a, a cesspit or throw it in to the sewage. I would just carry it to the river, and there's shit everywhere. London was famously known for how bad it smelled. That's why you there's a lot of uh, things that smelled nice were, were very good in London. Everyone was a big fan. But everywhere smelled bad. And people, they had big sewers. People, every, Everything would get thrown away. Same spot, trash, feces, whatever, gets thrown in the same spot. So the lowest class of people would wander through the streets or through the sewers looking through stuff that got thrown away. Somebody else's shit is somebody else's treasure, I guess. Ew, just ew. You got to do what you got to do. So, and people wanted to get all their feces out away from town because at this time... There's a theory called miasma, and miasma theory is that bad smells cause all sorts of diseases. Now, we know that that's not true now, but at the time, this was, I mean, this this was law, pretty much. I mean, everyone believes in miasma theory. And at the time, like we said, there's false publications. So, in medical journals, not just like ads in a paper, actual medical journals, false Cures were being published all the time. So in 1854, on Broad Street in London, in the Soho district, a cholera outbreak began. And everyone attributed to the miasma. Because the Broad Street well was the cleanest well around. Everyone everyone loved to go to the Broad Street well. People who didn't even live next to the Broad Street well would drink out of the Broad Street well. So we don't. no one had running tap water today like we do today. At the time, you had to go and collect your water. Now, where are you going to get your water? Yeah, the Broad Street well is nice, but if you live just another block away and there's a well closer to you, most of the time you're probably going to go there. But sometimes you might go to the other well. So it's incredibly hard to figure out who's drinking from what well. Multiple buildings, or the same building, would have different people drinking out of multiple wells, just depending on what side of the building their door faced. And again, a lot of these wells had terrible reputations and some had great reputations there were wells that smelled like sulfur and those wells had terrible reputations but people still lived right next to them so they drink out of them i can't imagine the stomach it takes to drink water that smells like rotten eggs like i i know everyone humans can get used to anything but that seems like a big hurdle to get over and since john snow was a physician in soho literally at the center of the outbreak, he began doing some investigation. Now, Jon Snow started asking all the people who died all sorts of things. And a bunch of other people were experimenting too. Like I said, the, there was a London Board of Health that was going around and they had a whole pamphlet asking people about all sorts of things. Mostly about the people who'd go and investigate the deaths and they'd ask, they'd take an account of where they lived and then what it smelled like inside, what it smelled like outside, any hazards, like any vents pushing bad fumes up because it smells like shit out here. This must be causing it. 
<laughs> and Jon Snow went and talked to all these people. He asked them all sorts of questions. And eventually he kind of pieced together, it seems like all these people, all the deaths, he made a map, all the deaths were centered around Broad Street. Not all of them, but most of them. And so then he kind of came up with a theory that the Broad Street well was causing the outbreak. So he's looking at the outliers. There's a woman who lived neighborhoods away who died of cholera at the same time. Well, that doesn't make any sense. That would d disprove his theory. So he went to go visit this woman in another neighborhood. She had died and her maid had died because her sons send them a pitcher of Broad Street water every week. And that's like her, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. She brags to all her neighbors that she gets Broad Street water once a week. That's a weird flex, but okay. Well, that's the nicest pump. Everyone knows about the Broad Street pump. Mike, there's wells out there that smell like rotten eggs. <laughs> Broad Street does yeah, not okay. smell like yeah. rotten eggs. So let's imagine if everyone else is drinking poop water and you got a nice fresh glass of water there you're gonna feel kind of like a big shot like a king <laughs> i feel like a king yeah but can but the the children the people who brought the pump brought the broad street well water to their mother they didn't die so i and he didn't tell them at the time i don't know if they ever found out but can you imagine being like oh you know you're trying to do something nice for your mom and you bring her this water and it ends up being what kills her that's got to hurt. So he went to a few other places and found out that these people who died far away had at one point drank Broad Street water. Or they stopped in town. They went to a restaurant in Soho that served Broad Street water. But there's also a bunch of people who live on Broad Street right next to it who didn't die. So what happened there? Well, there's a, a brewery there. And so he went in the brewery. He asked if they had any... You know, loss of employees because you go to any place around here and most of the employees are a lot are dead a lot left as soon as the cholera hit many just left town and all like 60 something employees of this brewery are still working it's like how how is no one here affected you're literally right next to the epicenter of the outbreak well the brewery had its own water supply and the people are given you know free alcohol so they were able to survive with just because they're on a different water supply. Wait, are you telling me that alcohol was part of the solution to save well, their lives? Well, I think it's more that separate water, not... <laughs> Shh, don't crush my dreams. Don't crush my dreams. I mean, if anything, to re help reduce cholera, there's some things that happen later on, but one of the biggest things is tea really put a damper on cholera's day just by bowling all your water. Hmm, interesting. But the Board of Health, and so Jon Snow took this data he had this beautiful map made and with all the dots all around the debt where the deaths were at centered around the broad street pump submitted it to the journal and the board of health and said look i think it's coming from this pump and the board of health didn't do anything they still thought that the miasma theory was what was doing it oh it smells like shit in soho so it must be it and there's other parts of the miasma theory too being clean is something only the upper class could afford. So if you were sick, it's because, you know, you live in shit, you live in squalor, you're a lower class citizen. So obviously, not only are you inferior as a human, but you also, you know, God's trying to take you out. So miasma theory was kind of, again, very institutionalized. Like this was the theory. Like this was people would go against it and they'd just be like are you a fucking idiot so they didn't listen but Jon Snow took it to the governors of the town the people who kind of ran around Broad Street showed on the map talked for a few hours like hey all these people around Broad Street are dying everyone who drinks from the pump is dying so they removed the pump handle and he got destroyed for it really all right now is this the governor or Jon Snow Jon Snow. Jon Snow and the people who removed it were heckled. Like, this was this was everyone's water supply. Now people would have to walk an extra two or three blocks to get water. This was a faint, like like I said, a well-known water hole, uh, well. I mean, 
this people were very upset. And the, the worst part of this is, you know, at the same time, everyone's coming out with these fake cures, you know, oh, a little bit of this will cure your, um, cure your cholera. And people, people are dying left and right. And some people kind of started figuring out a few cures, like people were starting to inject saline into people and it was shown to help them. But because you had all these fake cures also being published, no one really believed any of the real cures. And then far away in Italy, uh, Filippo Pacini identified the actual uh, vibro cholera bacteria, but we didn't have internet and all that. We couldn't communicate it. So no one knew what the cholera bacteria actually looked like. And again, germ theory, which is Snow's theory, was not a popular theory as opposed to miasma. And so they were doing some investigation of Robert Whitehead, who was a another member of the Soho community. He was appointed by the Board of Health to investigate the outbreak. And he was a big proponent of miasma. And he went around interviewing the same people Jon Snow interviewed. And his goal was to disprove Jon Snow's theory. But... Why do I get the feeling that he just proved it, not disproved it? <laughs> the more he started talking to people and the more investigating he did, he kind of came around to Jon Snow's theory that it was the Broad Street Pump. So That's impressive to choose a, to get an enemy to convince an enemy to come on your side. That's impressive. But he couldn't convince the, uh, the Board of Health. But it didn't matter because together Whitehead and Snow teamed up to find the source of the outbreak. Now, they knew it was coming from the Broad Street Pump, so they had to figure out why. Whitehead started uh, with his powers as in, like an investigator. He began to have people excavate around the Broad Street Pump. And they eventually figured out patient zero was a child. And the woman threw... So they found the first cholera death. It was a child, and the woman threw the baby's diaper into just out the window, you know, like like one does. That's so disgusting. Speaking of which, I guess I'm going to have to put this somewhere earlier, but for those of you who don't know, cholera, what it does is once it gets inside you, once you become infected by cholera, you basically diarrhea yourself to death. Do you die of dehydration because your body is losing so much liquid so quickly you can't replenish it no matter what you do so there's a lot of diapers that that family probably went through so the woman just threw it out the window because that's what you do with trash and they threw it out in their little courtyard kind of like in the middle of their building well that courtyard cesspit actually goes to within two feet over the broad street well is and the cholera was able to travel through the old bricks that the bricks were so eroded when they removed them in the excavation, they just came out. Like, you could just pull them out by hand. There was no chiseling or, or anything. But first, people had to shovel all of the shit out, right? So they could get down there. So I'm always curious if they told those shovelers that they thought that that was the beginning of the cholera outbreak or they're just like, hey, can you clean this out for us? Oh, they, they didn't tell them at all. No, there's no way. So eventually they figured out that the, like you said, their cesspit, their particular cesspit emptied right in the Broad Street pump. And here's the thing. The week after they removed the pump handle, the husband of that household died of cholera too. And guess where his shit was going? Right back into that pump, which would have prolonged the cholera outbreak, which would have essentially restarted it. It was on the decline when they removed the pump handle. But if it had been recharged with that the husband's infected feces essentially would have gone on. So Jon Snow, again, not recognized at the time, basically saved a ton of more people from, from dying, that from dying by dehydration, by diarrhea. Yeah, a city of what? You said 2 million people at the time? He probably saved at least 60%. Well, it's just that small area who drank from the Broad Street pump. So it wasn't the whole city. Because not, like I said, there's so many water sources. You, know, you go a few blocks away, people have a different water source. But it was not uncommon to have, I forget how many people it was. It was like, say, f 600 people to the acre or something. 
people are stacked on top of each other. I also imagine though they might go to different water sources if just you know I I feel like that disease could easily spread throughout the land, especially with how disgusting uh, their sewer system is. That's true, and so that kind of and after after they shut that off, that kind of ended the the outbreak, and you would think that Jon Snow would be this hero, but just another person who wasn't recognized for their value till after they died. Jon Snow died on the 16th of June in 1858. And at the time, he didn't even disprove miasma. So <laughs> people, even though he went through all that, established this map, and he tried to, even afterwards, he was trying to prove that his germ theory was correct. He made another map, same, the same area of Soho, centered around the Broad Street pump, and instead of doing just distance, he did walking distance. So he walked to every house where everyone died to map out if they were if their that house was closer to the Broad Street pump or closer to the neighboring pumps. Because people would look at a map around, say, like Broad Street and be like, well, look, it's miasma. There's something that smells bad there and everyone around there is being infected. But when you look at it from the time to pump, so closest pump, only the people closest to the Broad Street pump were being affected. Even if people who lived right next to it but got their water from the pump house weren't affected by it, that disproves miasma theory. And miasma theory was pretty easy to disprove because, like I said, there's people who roamed the sewers of London who did not die from this outbreak. And there are upper class people who did, which if someone, if miasma theory is true, the, wouldn't the people who work every day in the sewers be the first to go? And Jon Snow also worked for the trades. He presented a paper against miasma theory about they were trying to ban the dirty trades from London. So, you know, people who make hats, people who deal with skins, anything that produces a foul stench during production, they tried to ban it because of miasma. It was killing people. And he argued, why is it that the people in these trades aren't dying if this is as deadly as you say it is? And no one had a really good answer, because it turns out smells aren't killing people. And for those wondering, hat makers usually had to deal a lot with mercury. Uh, yeah, that's a, just a dangerous, dangerous toxin. Whole nother thing. But, yeah. But it was other, other stuff as well, not just hat makers. And he just compared lifespans of these workers versus lifespans of other people and said this should be... There should be a huge difference there, but there's not. But he did kind of sow the roots of the end of miasma theory. If he he never got to see it disproved, well, I mean, he in his mind disproved it, but he didn't see it disproved in everyone's mind. So it didn't end until after he died. There was something that really helped miasma theory it was the final stake i guess i don't you call it the uh so the death blow to miasma theory final nail in the coffin the nail in the coffin there we go is a historical event with the greatest name ever and i'm Dick talking Dick about no i'm talking about the great stink of 1858 the great stink the great once stink. again nick the british are really good at naming things they really are during the summer of 1858, it got so hot in London that it increased the smell of untreated human waste and industrial trash that was present in London, and deaths didn't go up. And again, this is the great stink. For a town already known to be one of the worst smelling in the world, this was worse. But... Uh... <laughs> But that should have exasperated deaths, right? If miasma theory was true and bad smells caused death, why why did it not start killing more people? Good point. And that was kind of the final nail in the coffin for miasma theory. And after that, they started, there was another, after the great stink, they figured out, hey, we got to do something with these sewers. And so they designed a huge sewer system, huge sewer system, to remove all the sewage from London in multiple different ways. Some was sent to farmland, some was sent out to the river. 
is someone sent out to sea, but it would only flow out on an outgoing tide, so it wouldn't send it back in. It took a lot of time, a lot of money, but because of it, London then became one of the cleanest cities. That's a 180. Yeah. So unfortunately, Jon Snow never got to see his theory proven or accepted by everyone. But it's crazy to me that I'd never heard of this man who invented anesthesia and germ theory and all these things. And just proved probably the most, one of the most popular causes for diseases of the time. Yeah, well, and there's another, I didn't talk about it, another reason why miasma theory is so popular. Who owns the air, Mike? God. Who owns water companies? Government. Well, private pe- people. Well, it's England, so I'm assuming the government. Well, it was involved. They have a monarchy, so who knows what goes on there. <laughs> but it's it's probably easier to blame the air than it is to blame a business or make someone responsible for everything that's going on, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Or, and I, I have no idea, but maybe, I think, uh, you know, there's people who maybe were involved in the whatever, who, people who were involved with the health who also owned water companies. And there's also problems with the water companies not following regulations and, and all this stuff. So I don't know exactly what the um what the relationship was between the water companies and the board of public health but i think there was some sort of relationship there of it's so much easier just to blame the error than it is to blame an actual solution but at the same time people believe that the lower class were an inferior folk who were just going to die because they're unsanitary conditions when in fact there is only one, maybe two working toilets at the time, and everyone just shit in buckets. <laughs> well, that's all I got on the Jon Snow and the cholera epidemic of London. Well, what I gather from it is uh, wash your hands, keep your shit away from your water, and boil your water. Yep. Clean drinking water. We take it for granted, that's for sure. Yes. Yes, we do. And if you want to learn more about the cholera epidemic and Jon Snow's work, I highly recommend the book Ghost Map by Stephen Johnson. It is awesome. It goes way in way more detail than I did, and it's just crazy what he did. Well, he's a man who saved dozens, if not, th- well, definitely more than dozens, hundreds, and yet maybe even tens of thousands of lives. So he's definitely uh, definitely newsworthy. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on